Father, we come before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love and your mercy to us. We pray as we continue through your word, Lord, you would work in our hearts. Please take these scriptures and open them to us that we might understand what's coming. And Lord, also that we would understand just how important it is to let our light so shine before men. Thank you for this time. Pray you bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Dan Glau, are you here? It's your birthday, isn't it? Yeah, you thought you were safe because we already did. So let's sing for Dan. Happy birthday to you. There you go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dan. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, I thought of it after the fact, so you're, you're, you're getting busted anyway. Happy birthday. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, but you taught this two weeks ago. Yeah, I know. Hang in there. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know, that will not see, know not God, and that obey, hupakuo, don't want to listen, obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we covered that. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Again, this letter coming only months after the first Thessalonians, where they were told the Lord himself will descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, dead in Christ rise, and then we who are alive remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So our gathering together unto him. We beg you that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither <clears throat> by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. It's already happened, this judgment. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And we talked about some early indicators of these things going on within the church. And that man of sin shall be revealed the son of perdition. Again, this antichrist. How is he revealed? How do you know it's him? Pop quiz. What is it? How many are saying peace treaty under their breath? Peace treaty. Peace treaty. Good. Those who said peace treaty, you got it. We studied that. That man of sin will be revealed through a peace treaty who opposes and exalts himself, verse 4, above all that is called God and opposes and exalts himself above all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, and again, the holy place of God, showing himself that he is God. Yeah, yeah, Pastor, you went through all those scriptures last week, and our fingers still have cramps, and you took us all over, and, and you covered all of them. No, he didn't. Oh. Turn left. Matthew, Malachi, Zechariah. Matthew, Malachi, Zechariah. Don't worry, these are shorter than the last ones we did. So, Matthew left Malachi, Zechariah 11. And once again, Zechariah is writing about 530 or so BC. These things occur in 70 AD, a difference of almost 600 years that these things would be prophesied. And again, prophecy is simply history in advance. Prophecy, think of it as prehistory. Once it becomes history, it's much easier to understand. Like that the Messiah will die with the wicked, yet be buried with the rich. You understand that clearly now if you know what happened to Jesus. So chapter 11, Zechariah says, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour thy cedars. Question, where was the wood from that was inside the temple? There you go. They're going to burn. How, fair tree or fir tree, the cedar is fallen... Because the mighty are spoiled, howl, O you oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage is come down. Interesting. When the Romans besieged Jerusalem, they deforested 12 miles out from the city, building their ramparts, their siege engines, and everything else. They literally just stripped the countryside of wood as part of that siege. For the forest of the vintage has come down. For there is a voice, verse 3, of the howling of the shepherds, that is the Jewish leaders, for their glory is spoiled, a voice of the roaring of young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. Again, they're wiped out as the idea. Thus saith the Lord, my God, feed the flock of the slaughter. Wait a minute. The flock of the slaughter. 
Why is this flock being, being given over to slaughter? Because they rejected the shepherd. Remember when Jesus rode in on the donkey, he saw Jerusalem, he began to weep. He said, if you, even you, knew in this your day the things that are made for your peace, but now they're hid from your eyes, your enemies will build the ramparts around you, will tear down the walls, you and your little children, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Something came to me, a thought occurred to me the other day. When the Jews failed to keep the Sabbath for 490 years, God finally said through Jeremiah and others, all right, that's it, you owe me. You owe me Sabbath rest on the land. So here's what we're going to do. You guys are going to Babylon. You're going to be deported. The land is going to rest for 70 years. After that, I'll bring you back. And in Daniel chapter 9, which we talked about last week, Daniel was reading Jeremiah, saw that the 70 years were coming to a close, began to seek after God about, well, now what? And that's when God gave to him in chapter 9, 70 sevens are determined upon your holy city, Jerusalem, your holy people, the Jews. And then God began to give Daniel instruction. So because they failed to keep the Sabbath, they got put in time out for 70 years, if you think about it. Well, if you've been paying attention to history, in 1948, they finally regained the land. They've, yes, they've been coming in slowly for the last 100 years or so be, before that, but in 1948, suddenly Israel's back in the land after having been in time out for basically 2,000 years. So if they didn't keep the Sabbath and that got them a 70 year timeout, what did they mess up that gave them a 2000 year timeout? He came to his own and they received him not. Interesting. Verse five, whose possessors, that would be the Romans, slay them and hold themselves not guilty. If you read the historical accounts, you'll see where it says that. And they that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their own shepherds, their own Jewish leadership, pity them not. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. But lo, I will deliver the men, every one of them, into his neighbor's hand, as Jerusalem was close to falling. There were three factions as well as some other groups. They were all fighting internally within the walls of Jerusalem. So while the Romans are outside trying to take the city down, the Jews from different factions and power struggles were killing each other on the inside. It was madness. Read Josephus. It was madness of what was happening just before the city fell. Their own shepherds pity them not. I'll deliver the man, every one into his neighbor's hand. Verse 6. Look at this. Verse 6. And I will deliver him into the hand of his king. And his king and his people, they shall smite the land out of their hand, and I will not deliver them. Wait a second. Wait a second. <clears throat> Do you remember when Pilate brought Jesus out? And he said, behold the man, John's gospel, chapter 19. And the people cried, away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. And then there's some more dialogue. And he said, shall I crucify your king? And they said, we have no king but Caesar. Now look at the prophecy. And I will deliver him into the hand of his king. The Romans wiped them out. And what did they say near the end? We have no king but Caesar. Interesting. They shall smite the land. And out of their hand will I not deliver them. And I will feed the flock of slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. I took unto me two staves. I called one beauty and the other bands, and I fed the flock. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month. There were three leaders, John, Simon, and Eliezer. During that time in the city when all that fighting was going on, they were three different leaders, and they were all three killed within one month. Now, with it being historic, it's obvious to see. Three shepherds also will I cut off in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Then said I, I will not feed you. That that dieth, let it die. That that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one of the flesh of another. Guess what happened as the siege continued? They fell into cannibalism. That's also documented. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. And it was broken in that day. So the poor of the flock, look at this, that waited upon me, knew not that it was, or knew, sorry, that it was the word of the Lord. Interesting observation. <clears throat> the poor of the flock that waited upon me. Historians tell us in 66 AD, Cestius Gallius of the Romans encircled Jerusalem. But then for some strange reason withdrew for a little bit of time. Does that ring any bells? 
Jesus said in Luke 21, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, then what did he say? Get out. Right? These be the days of vengeance. Go back and look and look, look in Luke's gospel. You try that. Look in Luke's gospel. Try that. It's not as easy as it sounds, is it? Go back and look in Luke's gospel and you'll see. So according again to history, tradition, what we have is when the Christians in 66 saw the city surrounded and Cestius pulled back, they all left. Some say completely. We won't know until we get to heaven. They all left. Now when the Romans came back, only left inside were the unbelieving, those who hadn't received Christ. That's going to be interesting to find out the details on in heaven. But that happened in history. The poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. You know, pastor, this is really thin. You're trying to attach all this to the time of Jesus. I think you're really reaching for it. Next verse. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. This is all part of the rejection. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Ring any bells? And the Lord said unto me, cast it to the potter, a goodly price that I was prized of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Sound familiar? This is about Jesus. Then I cut asunder mine other staff, even bands, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. And the Lord said unto me, take ye unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish, the idea is a coarse or a hardened shepherd, for lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he, this foolish shepherd, shall eat the flesh of the fat and shall tear their claws in pieces. He will devour them. Do you remember last week we were in Daniel and we saw that fourth kingdom? that had teeth and iron and all the other things devouring Look what he says, verse 17. Woe to the idle shepherd. Now, it can be someone who's worthless. It can be someone who, who, who's not active in a sense, but it can also be someone who brings an idol. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up. He will lose the use of his arm. His eye shall be utterly darkened. He will lose the use of his eye. So there's a false shepherd coming who will destroy and attack God's people and scatter them and devour them. And there's going to be something that happens to him that causes one of his arms to no longer function and his right eye to be darkened. Does that ring any bells? And the world marveled after the beast that had one of its heads wounded and the deadly wound was healed. Remember that last week, Revelation 13? The false prophet shows up, gets all the nations to make an image to the beast whose deadly wound was healed. Again, this rising false Christ. Okay, well, now that's all of it. Uh, one more. Go to Daniel. One more time. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had his dream. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has his own dream. Sees there the rising of the Antichrist. Sees there the Ancient of Days seated on the throne. Then we get to Daniel chapter 9. He's given the timetable, 77s. We learn again that there will be this Antichrist who will make a covenant with many for seven years, one week. In the midst of the week, he will break that covenant, and all of a sudden we got all kinds of trouble. But there was one more text God gave to him. That's Daniel chapter 11. Now, Daniel chapter 11. Why didn't you do this last week? Not enough time. In Daniel chapter 11, it is a remarkable section of scripture, and, and no way can we cover it here. I encourage you to go back, listen to it on the app online. But in verses 1 through 35, there are basically about 135 prophetic events. In other words, things Daniel prophesied before they happened, and they have come to pass with exacting fulfillment. Shocking critics. How could God possibly, or how could a man know these things? He can't. Who gave it to him? God did. So here we have these, these 30, 135 prophetic things that happened. But in verse 21 to 35, there is an individual who is called the Antichrist of the Old Testament. He's not the Antichrist. Why? Because he stops at verse 35. But his name was Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV, and he, was risen, he rose up about 175 to 164 BC. And how many know of the festival, or the, the feast of, of Hanukkah, or Chinooka on your calendar? How many? Hanukkah? Hanukkah? No? Dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. I have... None of you know about Hanukkah. I'm getting you all Hanukkah menorahs in. For... You'll know when we're done. What happened? 
When Antiochus Epiphanes rose to power, they were fighting between Syria and Egypt, Syria and Egypt, a lot of intrigue, but he eventually came back, he desecrated the temple, slaughtered a pig, put an image of Jupiter, Zeus up, not of himself, but of the, the, basically the mythology of the Roman gods, defiled it with pagan gods, and he persecuted the Jews horribly. Eventually, the Maccabees, Judas Maccabee and Matthews, they, rode up, they rose up and they cast out and they got, again, control of the temple. When they went in to, to sanctify it, because it had been desecrated, they found only enough oil for one day to keep the menorah lit, and that lasted for eight days. That's why they have the eight-branched menorah for Hanukkah with the little branch for the oil. It was a miracle of God, and it happened again about the 164 time frame. This thing went down, and, and it was a reminder. God was again going to be moving in the nation. That's what's happening in this 21 to 35. But there are some interesting overlaps. Look at verse 21. A vile person will rise up. He will come in peaceably to obtain a kingdom by flatteries. Sound familiar? He'll make a league, verse 23. He'll make agreements. And after that, he'll work deceitfully. Again, verse 23. He'll come up with and become strong with a small people. Verse 24. He'll enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor among his father's fathers. And he'll scatter among the prey, or among them, the prey and the spoil and the riches. When Antiochus would conquer, he would divide out and he would distribute a lot of that, that booty or that wealth from it to all those who were following him to, of course, get them to support him. So you thought spreading the wealth around was new. He did it. But then we get to verse 36. This Antiochus Epiphanes did not do. So verse 36 is still prophetic. It has not happened. Up through verse 35, historic, been fulfilled. Over a roughly 400-year period, these things were fulfilled. But this is yet to happen, and here again is this antichrist, this little horn that spoke blasphemous things, this prince that is to come who will make a covenant for one week. Daniel given one final piece of information. And the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and he shall prosper until the indignation, the idea is froth of the mouth, the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. That rings a bell. Seventy sevens are determined upon your holy city, Jerusalem, your holy people, the Jews. In other words, God is allowing this. He has a timetable. That which has been determined will be done. A final seven years, halfway through it will be cut off, and then all kinds of great tribulation is going to break out. That that shall be determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, so he's apparently an apostate Jew in a sense, nor the desire of women, nor the regard of any God. Now note that, please, verse 37. God of his fathers, desire of women, nor any God. Context seems to be things that are desired or worshipped of God. Why do I say that? Well, one, God the Father, God of his fathers. Two, the desire of women, some argue, is the Messiah. Every woman in Israel hoped that perhaps they might be the one God would use to birth the Messiah, the seed of the woman. Others say no, what that is, is he does not have a desire for women and that he is a homosexual. When will we know for sure? When it's history. Third thing though, but he also will not regard any God. He will magnify himself above them all. But in his estate, he shall honor the God of forces. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. This is why some, if you're paying attention out there, some are saying perhaps there will be a connection with Islam, because Islam doesn't show up until 600 AD, which none of the fathers would have known at that time, be they church or Jew. But history will make it obvious once it's over. There are a lot of people taking that theory right now and running with it. It'll know, we'll know for sure when it's over. So thus shall he do, verse 39, and the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. He shall cause him to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at that time of the end, final seven years, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land that would be Israel and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon or Ammon. Question, 
Those three locations are located in what state today? Jordan. If you got Jordan, you got a gold star. Now, I know what you're thinking. Man, he has gotten nowhere in 2 Thessalonians in weeks here. And this is driving me crazy. Well, okay, fine. We're going we're gonna to move on. But a little pastoral advice. If you have no room in your heart for the love of God in your life through his son, Jesus Christ, if you have no love for God, you're, you've been dragged out today, promised brunch, whatever your story is, and here you are. Let me tell you something. Why you would not want to be forgiven of your sins, why you would not want that indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, which God gives to those who believe. When we confess the Lord Jesus with our mouth, when we believe from our heart that God rose him from the dead, Romans 10, 9 tells us we will be saved. And having been saved, Ephesians 1 tells us he seals us with the Holy Spirit. He tells us in chapter 4, he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And he fills us with the love of God, that peace that comes from God, and he changes us from the inside out. Why you would not want that in your life is a complete mystery to me. But if that's you today, then I want to give you some advice. When you show up here one week and no one is here, and you're able to go down to the kitchen or break room or whatever we call it now, and have at it for snacks, and you can go up and down throughout all the building and do whatever you want, and then it finally dawns on you, you go, hey, where is everyone? At that time, may I make a suggestion? Move to Jordan. Pastoral help is over. <laughs> These shall escape out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. For he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, the Antichrist, and the land of Egypt, and they shall not escape. And... He shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians, and they shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north will trouble him. Therefore shall they go forth with great fury to destroy. Anybody want to guess where they're all going to meet? Armageddon, you got it. And utterly make a way. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas, Mediterranean, probably Dead Sea, and in the glorious holy mount, yet he shall come to his end, none shall help him. Okay, so now we can go back to our text. Now, you want to talk about cliff notes. Look how Paul just condensed two weeks worth of stuff. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there coming a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. How will you know it's him? Peace agreement. Very good. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. You've heard this before, is what he's saying. Verse 6, and now you know, the word is ido, now you see or perceive, now you know what withholdeth that he, the Antichrist, might be, here's that word again, unveiled, that he might be revealed in his season. So you know what's withholding. Wait a second. Let's review. Who empowers the Antichrist? The devil. How many got that? Great. You just figured out Revelation 13, 12, here comes the devil, 13, here comes his rising false Christ, and that false Christ is empowered by demonic power. Good. You got that figured out. Okay. So Satan would like to deceive the world and drag them down into judgment and self-destruction. So why hasn't he done it yet? Well, pastor, don't you know history has been world wars? Oh, yes, there have. But not like this. Why has he not done it thus far? Does he want to do it? Well, yeah, what did Jesus tell us? What's his bio? Satan was a liar from the beginning, a murderer, right? A thief. So why not happen? Why hasn't he done it? Ah, some said Holy Spirit. Let me say, let me say, go ahead, let me say. I agree with you. Holy Spirit. Okay, well, here's the thing. Look at verse 6. And now you know what, what's keeping this from happening. What withholdeth? The word withholdeth means to quash, to suppress. The idea is to hinder, okay, or to, to crush or to hold down. It's called let or letteth here, old King James English. But that which with, was holding back or suppressing. Now you know what withholds. So 
What is withholding satanic power so that satanic power cannot just go for it and seek to destroy humankind? What's withholding that? Okay, Holy Spirit. Now, some say it's government. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> oh, because you have government too. Some say it's government. Some say it's the Roman government. Some say it's the Pope. Some say it's, uh, what else do we have here? The law. Some say it's Michael the Archangel. Do you remember when Jesus, they brought a man to him who was mute? In one case, he's, he's also deaf, but mute. And Jesus drove out the demon and healed him. And the people began to marvel. This is Matthew 12, Luke 11. People began to marvel and they said, hey, could this be the son of David? And the leadership said, no, no. He casts out demons by the prince of demons. He casts out demons by Beelzebub. How many remember that? Okay, see, why did that happen? Well, the Jews were told, when your God comes and saves you, Isaiah 35, 4 through 6, he will open the eyes of the blind, ears of the deaf, the mute will speak, the lame will walk. So they were looking for one who would do those signs, and that's why when you read the Gospel of John, over and over, Jesus refers to the miracles that he did. Hello, hello, there, I'm doing it. So when he heals this one who's mute, oh, let me explain. You see, in the Jews, in their tradition, their history, what they say is, to deliver someone from a demon, you have to get its name so you could take authority over it in the name of God and cast it out. So for the normal Jewish exorcist, you'll meet them in the book of Acts and elsewhere, for the normal Jewish exorcist, if that person is mute, they viewed the case as hopeless. We can't even try. So when they bring to Jesus one deaf and mute, different accounts, of course, there's different information there, but when they bring one to Jesus who is absolutely hopeless and he delivers him from the demon that the mute now speaks, the people go, whoa, this is way different than what we're used to. Hey, I think this might be the son of David. And rather than the religious leadership say, that's got to be him, they instead distract and say, this is satanic. And so Jesus says to him, listen, a house divided against itself cannot stand. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Satan doesn't cast out Satan. Come on, how many have read this? You're familiar with this. Okay, you're, okay good. Some of you are like, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And he said, look, no one can go into a strong man's house unless he first bind the strong man. And then he can go in and take whatever he wants. And he rebuked him and said, so if I drive out demons by the power of God or the finger of God, then the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. Hello, it's here. And you refuse to see it. What Jesus was saying is he's stronger than the devil. And he can bind anything the devil's done and take anyone out of the household of Satan he wants and bring him into his kingdom. He's got all power. So now the question, what is withholding satanic power? I agree with you. It's the power of God, the Holy Spirit. Why do you say the Holy Spirit? Well, because we've always been a church and that's what they told us. Now, wait a minute. Let's think about it. Let's think about it biblically. What did we learn in Daniel chapter 7? There was the Ancient of Days seated on his throne. Who was brought to him? One like the Son of Man, who was given dominion and power to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. Okay. Well, when Jesus died and rose again, where did he ascend to? Right hand of the... Father, and he promised to send the Holy Spirit. And that happened on the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit filled Peter. He preached it. The people believed it. Thousands were added to the church. And there was birthed on the day of Pentecost this new work of God called the church, empowered by the Spirit. And Jesus told us, let your light so shine before men that when they see your good works, they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven. And he told us that we are to be salt and light. Salt was used to keep meat from corrupting, decaying. Question. Church was born on a day. You've learned if you've been with us for a few weeks. Church is removed on a day. When you remove salt and light, what's left behind? Darkness and corruption. And now there's nothing restraining. Now, there were people who got saved before the day of Pentecost by faith. The Spirit of God was still calling people to himself. And there will be people who get saved after the rapture during the tribulation. But that work of the Spirit where he's restraining is removed. Doesn't mean he ceases to exist, ceases to be omnipresent, everything else he does, the Spirit of God. But he now is stepping back. 
and the world is finally going to get what it wants. You want God out of the schools? Fine. God will get out of the schools. You want God out of government? Fine. God will get out of government. You want God out of health care? Fine. God is going to get out of health care. God is going to give to this world when he removes his spirit. He's going to give this world an unrestrained version of this world. And it is going to be shocking. You know what is withholding that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Verse 7. Only he who, same word, restrains or you know, suppresses or squashes. He who restrains will restrain until he, masculine personal pronoun, he be taken out of the way. Jesus said, if you love me, keep what? Keep my commandments. John 14, 15. John 14, 16. And I will send you another comforter, even the Holy Spirit of God, and he will be with you, he will be in you, and he will be with you forever. So God has given to his church the spirit and promises to never take the spirit from us. And so people, if you're living in faith, you've received Christ, which means you've received the Holy Spirit. You are right now part of what is, with, what is restraining basically that evil. You, never, you might not think about this, but you are basically the, the bulwark or the backstop against which darkness and corruption, assuming we keep our voice and we speak our mind, finds resistance. You are in your job maybe the only salt and light that's there or your neighborhood or your soccer group or whatever you're in. God has allowed us right now to be around and throughout the community and throughout this state to be salt and light and to be witnesses for the fact that there is a day coming when God has to judge this world. He's judged these things on his son, but if you won't receive them, then he's going to judge this world. You guys know the truth. And now how often we underestimate the influence God has given to us by the Spirit. Right now, he's restraining because there's salt and light on this earth. The Spirit of God is working through God's people and has made himself known through the church in this unique relationship with the church. You know what restrains until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8. Notice verse 7, verse 8. The mystery of iniquity is already at work. John, 1 John, chapter 2, chapter 4 talks about the spirit of Antichrist. It's always been working, but it's going to get focused in the last days when the restraining work is removed. You know what is restraining, but the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he who restrains will restrain, verse 7, until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8, don't miss this, and what? And what? And then... He who restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Question, how's he revealed? Peace agreement. How many are now with me? All right, all right, can we move on? Can we move on? Sure, look at this. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, that two-edged sword that goes out of his mouth, Revelation 19 shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, Revelation 19, beast in the, anti the Antichrist, false prophet, suddenly taken. That's easy, we know that now. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, satanically empowered, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. We have to come back to that. And with all deceivableness, uh, hold on a second, verse 10, you need to again pay attention to they and them versus we, you, and us. How many got it? Okay, we're back to that. With all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish. Why do they perish? Because they received not the love of the truth. And what is that truth? That God sent his son to pay for you. They received not the love of the truth. What would that do for them? Verse 10, that they might be saved. If you will not receive the truth of Jesus dying and rising again to pay for your sins, then you have no salvation. But if you will receive it, the Bible says you will be saved. You decide. They would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, what cause? That they would not receive the love of the truth. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe these, the idea, the pseudos. What is pseudos? When you say something pseudo, what do you mean? It's false. It's a lie. Now, this is encouraging, don't you think? Maybe not. But look at verse 13. What does it say? But. 
Thank God it's there. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, beloved brethren. Because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but pastor, these lying signs and wonders, those sound really cool. What are they? We're out of time. Let's stand, let's pray. We'll get that next week. So you, yeah, I know. Stand and pray. Get it next week. Father, we thank you for your word. We're in interesting times. You said in the last days, evil would become good. Good would become evil. The love of men would wax cold. They would be without natural affection. Professing to be wise, they would become fools and they would be turned over to their own foolishness. And here we stand, Lord, in the midst of this generation, knowing the truth, having been forgiven, having our hearts filled with the Spirit of God, having learned from you what it's like to be forgiven, to be loved anyway, to be accepted, to be welcomed, Lord, even in a sense with rejoicing and brought into your family. We know the truth. God, help us not to be silenced. Help us not to be quiet. Because that time to be a light and to be salt for you is running out. God, help us to have such a relationship with you that people can't ask, what is it? And we get a chance to tell them there's a God who loves them. Thank you for all these things, Lord. Strengthen your people this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.